You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Mythos March continues today with a fabulous and new mythos story called The Lighthouse by the American author Aaron Vleck. Expanding on the events that transpired in the shadow over Innsmouth, Vleck provides the following synopsis. A newly minted psychotherapist with a specialty in dream swimming sets out to discover if any of the troubling rumors about the old lighthouse, hastily repurposed as a psychiatric facility slash research center, are true. Be sure to visit Vleck's website, linked in the video description below. Artwork by the great Vishnu Prasad. And without further ado. The Lighthouse by Aaron Vleck I had completed my medical degree with an exemplary performance from a small university, and then retired to my aged father's home in Arkham for some much-needed R&R. &R. The old man rejoiced in my success, and relished the many colourful exploits of a young man on his own about town that I shared with him before the roaring fire he required on even the sultriest August evenings. I also welcomed the chance to repay the unending kindnesses he had shown me since my mother's death when I was still an infant. Despite my notable academic performances, all applications for staff positions and fellowships at the many prestigious hospitals and clinics in the New York City area went unheeded or returned with politely vague and impersonal replies in the negative. Fortunately, I did get one enthusiastic response from Miskatonic Hospital, on the campus of that ancient bastion of academic acumen, and after a remarkably brief interview and cursory glance at my grades, I was signed on as a fellow in that institution's psychiatric wing. This situation suited me quite well, as it allowed me to remain at home with my father, and also to pursue more advanced courses on campus gratis within my primary discipline and so began my deeper plunge into the darkest, uncharted wastes of the troubled human mind. It also allowed me to undertake certain experimental byways of thought, theory, and practice Miskatonic is internationally renowned for. I pursued this career passionately for five years, in which I thrived intellectually, was promoted accordingly, and published numerous papers and one highly regarded volume for the advanced academic audience. I was also on hand to preside over the sad but peaceful death of my father. Other more troubling events were taking place in the neighbouring town of Innsmouth, that decayed and crumbling seaport some few miles away. The highly irregular and violent fate of that town— one with a long and storied history in the darker pages of the local folklore, was chronicled extensively everywhere, from the tabloids to the New York Times, and was even the subject of a barely fictionalized novella by H. P. Lovecraft, that notable scholar of the region. I had only been to Innsmouth once in my childhood, when my father travelled there unexpectedly to make a delivery— a journey for which he had apologized profusely over ensuing years, inquiring oddly if I had any questions. At the time I had none, but I often recalled the peculiar demeanor and sidelong furtive glances with which he queried me on the topic. Of course I had heard the silly warnings and obscene speculations volleyed at the decrepit little burg all my life, but all too many people in these rural communities and dying backwaters are prone to such uncharitable and ignorant nonsense. But I will say, growing up in such communities and thereabouts, I was all too familiar with the curiously proud habit of marrying a bit too close to home and among one's own familiar lines and the unsettling results thereof. 
As a medical man, this was no mystery to me, and I always determined to guide people away from these antiquated practices when possible, and turned a bemused ear to the more esoteric and ghoulish whispering about the people in neighbouring Innsmouth. My career by that time had struck a bit of a bottleneck of sorts, as my superiors were all of an age with myself. This, coupled with Miskatonic's unusually liberal policies regarding research, breadth of acceptable topics considered, and the funding thereof found nowhere else in these forty-eight states, brought one's aspirations into steep competition with the best minds in the field. The locale is so rich with local history and colour, with countless records dating back to the very founding of the colonies. All of this makes for a natural and fecund environment for much advancement in the more outré fields of inquiry. Hence I was root-bound and highly open to new opportunities. I had no idea at the time of the Innsmouth Troubles dominating the headlines that February in 1928 that my own course was about to take a most dramatic turn. I followed the news pouring out of Innsmouth as carefully as my schedule permitted, and was more than a little concerned by the constant rumours from reliable sources of unaccountable disappearances of many of Innsmouth's residents. There was even talk of secret incarcerations and brutal interrogations by government roustabouts at undisclosed locations. Most startling of all were the reports of obscure medical experimentation and radical procedures, unheard of even by me, being performed upon the former residents as well as upon a large number of elusive creatures hauled up from the bottom of the sea, and swimmers taken captive in chains from Devil's Reef. I could scarcely believe these last reports, and set out to discover the truth from my superiors, whereupon I was scoffed at with every turn, looked at askance as though I were utterly mad, and told most firmly to drop the matter at once upon peril of any future career I might hope to pursue. Of course I agreed immediately, and halted all overt inquiry, while doubling down on more covert methods of investigation that were available to me. It was at that time, no coincidence certainly, that I was hastily called up for an interview at a new psychiatric hospital, recently opened in Innsmouth upon the site of a derelict lighthouse. The tower of that facility now housed the main administrative offices and examination and interview rooms. The rest of the hospital had sprung up virtually overnight, as a warren of low buildings and sub-basements, surrounding the central spire of the repurposed lighthouse which remained, for some reason, fully functional or newly restored. This detail remained unclear, but I hastened to answer the summons of the interview enthusiastically, knowing that even if employment were not forthcoming, the visit would provide ample opportunity to nose about under the guise of professional interest. Some of my own colleagues suggested that such a hastily risen facility might be the best place to seek information about the recent abductions. The drive out to the New England Research Institute for New Medicine was cold and drizzly, a heavy fog listing idly over the road and obscuring the surrounding countryside. Only the deafening sound of the sea breaking along the rocky coast assured me I was on the right track and that my destination must lay straight ahead. When the imposing tower of the lighthouse suddenly broke through the fog, I pulled into the parking lot, killed my engine, and just sat there staring at that imposing peak. No one in New England is any stranger to lighthouses, as they dot the coast frequently, a charming and welcome vision to locals and tourists alike. Not so this institute and its overflowering of attached buildings that spread over the grounds like dark-rooted vines. The whole picture portrayed a cold and inhospitable sterility that made me long for the open road and a speedy return to Arkham. Almost in a daze, but soldiering on because I knew I must, I soon found myself in the office of Dr. Randolph Bessinger, the hospital's director, 
listening to the usual recruitment spiel, delivered much too enthusiastically for my tastes. So, you see, Dr. Gilman, the Institute offers many rare opportunities for research, as well as the chance to be of service to your government in ways seldom found in, well, in peacetime. Do you have any questions for me, Dr. Gilman? Bessinger purred at the conclusion of his remarks, grinning like a Cheshire cat in his certainty that I'd been hanging on his every word, just waiting for the right moment to throw myself at his feet and beg him for a job. This kind of hubris galls me, and if for no other reason than this, Dr. Bessinger slid with a snug click into my sights. Well, just the one so far, I suppose, I began with mock hesitancy. Yes, Dr. Gilman, he added with an infuriating grin. Why did you offer me this position? I had never even heard of your facility before your letter. Well, we are quite new, he chuckled. Just opened and all. And your experience and academic pursuits, well, it seemed a perfect fit, and he explained, but I cut him off. Why me specifically? I demanded lightly, but he took notice. You had made certain inquiries, he replied, his eyes narrowing. Inquiries? I asked, feigning utter confusion. Now I have you, I thought, already planning my next moves. Yes, you seem to have a rather piqued curiosity about the research we are conducting here, and I thought perhaps you might wish a closer look, and perhaps prove useful in our work, he added, regarding me closely. Tell me more, I said, leaning forward and looking at him with interest. Dr. Bessinger turned on the beam of what I would soon learn was meant to disarm and inspire camaraderie, but it did nothing of the sort, and only furthered my growing sense that much was gravely amiss here. Perhaps it would be more illustrative for us to take a tour of the facility, and let you meet some of our patients, he said, standing and ushering me toward the door. For the next two hours we strode through a warren of halls, in and out of room after room, and I made the acquaintance of scores of pitiful patients. Bessinger proudly detailed a litany of affronts to sanity, baseless claims and superstitious poppycock I would never have imagined could spew so casually from the mouth of an educated man, much less a medical professional with claims to the newest discoveries and techniques. The man's rant kept coming back to clearing the swamp, and protecting the nation, and degenerate abominations, and infested seas, and other sham excuses for the deplorable and heartbreaking conditions these so-called patients endured. Former residents of Innsmouth, to the last of them, they all suffered a sickly, putrescent hue, broad, fleshy lips, and huge, unblinking eyes. I could not determine how much of these characteristics were common among Innsmouth's residents, and how much was the result of the bizarre apparatuses and unwholesome tanks of unknown fluids I spied some patients floating in, seemingly unconscious or dead. I held my tongue, not wanting to betray the disgust that filled me with rage, and the gorge that almost drove me in search of a toilet more than once. But it was the drooping, hairless heads, the listless glances, and pleading, desperate stares that bore into me from every one of them, as they lay motionless on their miserable cots, or sat upright strapped into rickety wheelchairs and other less obvious contraptions, or in those malignant tanks. The final visitation, the pièce de résistance, which Bessinger held in reserve, and was clearly intended to seduce me unconditionally to his cause, was, of course, the old woman. The ancient and emaciated beldam was strapped securely in a rickety wooden wheelchair, her wrists and ankles bound tightly to the arms and legs of the infernal contraption. Her balding pate was covered with a few long coarse hairs, as well as a few sprouting from her thick, fleshy upper lip. 
She leered at me suggestively, her unusually long pointed tongue slithering out to wipe her parched lips, while the unblinking, lidless eyes communicated to me her lengthy and very different story. The crone was wrapped in bandages, and the tattered remains of what must have long ago been the finery of a bygone era, the velvet and silk of widow's weeds, but was now nothing more than faded rags. The woman's broad, thick neck was wrapped in a filthy embroidered scarf that slid here and there, revealing deep gashes or lacerations on both sides. I noted Bessinger was always quick to replace the scarf and cover that rigid neck, even though the abnormalities did not seem like wounds at all, but rather quite normal features of her anatomy. What captured my eye next were the ornate gold bracelets hanging from the bony wrists and huge necklace of antediluvian design clinging to the crepey folds of her throat, and I marvelled that such treasures remained unmolested upon her person in such a place. Do not be fooled, Dr. Gilman. This creature could savage us both were she not securely restrained. No one here would steal her jewels, or even touch them, he sneered. The most hideous trinket in her collection is a tall sort of spiked crown the wretch would insist upon wearing, were it not locked securely in my safe. "'For God's sake!' I roared. "'Can't you at least give the poor creature some fresh clothing?' "'Creature is right, Dr. Gilman. And we have tried—oh, have we tried!' he snorted with derision. Every attempt was met with screeching and the ripping and rending of flesh by claws any jungle cat would be proud of, Bessinger explained as I looked on in horror. Dr. Gilman, may I present to you Miss Majestic Marsh? By all accounts, and from what few records we have available, this woman is the eldest sister of Innsmouth's notorious ancient mariner, Obed Marsh a man himself of uncanny longevity, and predated by this creature of absolutely impossible age, leading us to conclude, naturally and in accordance with the obvious, that Majestic Marsh has very little in common with what is left of the decent human population in these parts, which was precisely why the government moved as it did upon the infestation at Innsmouth, and why you were called, Dr. Gilman to help us learn as much as we can before we eradicate these abominations and ensure no further foothold gains any place upon our human soil. Bessinger concluded like a politician stumping for votes. The Navy, he resumed, will see to the virulent spread and perhaps its very source out at Devil's Reef. I looked again on the broken but proud and haughty form of Majestic Marsh, for whom the name must have truly been a thing of terrible awe in its time, however far back into the early days of this nation that must have been. I betrayed nothing in my demeanour, but I could barely keep my wits about me, as the penetrating silent scream from that wizened alien mind rang through my mind like a sledgehammer and those pleading eyes reached into some long-hidden place within my soul. I knew that everything my modern scientific mind and my medical hubris had denied was true. Majestic Marsh's feet and hands, bound though they were, flapped and flippered desperately for any possible escape, her head locked and unmoving, but her eyes following me wherever I went. I shall bring everything within my power to bear upon these matters, Dr. Bessinger, I assured him. Then he took me on a tour of the sub-basements and the huge tanks filled with sluggishly moving green or yellow fluid, and the solitary occupants that bore no resemblance whatsoever to anything human, not even to the grandiloquent majestic marsh in her decrepit wheelchair and faded racks. The drive home to Arkham was a frenzied mania of warning images, and the steaming remains of long-held truths as they devolved into unordered madness, 
into the very realms of chaos. The field of psychiatry is deeply committed to the treatment of traumatic shock, which at times can be so violent as to snap the human mind like a twig and cause permanent damage, including catatonic states and paralysis from which the patient may never recover. Some war veterans present these states and symptoms, as do those who witness acts so heinous the victim has no other recourse than to flee for safety so deeply within themselves that it constitutes what a colleague of mine has termed living suicide. The body is discarded, left behind to live or die as it will, with no care from that dynamic and quickening principle, that elusive animating spark we call consciousness. Surely, many people laying eyes for the first time upon creatures such as Majestic Marsh would undergo a shock to the system, nothing short of another sort of loss of virginity, a life-changing break from one's precious assumptions and beliefs in what is the known, the reliable, and the real, by which we strive to navigate our world and inner cosmos. But here we are, our world is in fact peopled with beings very unlike us, yet capable of breeding with us, of founding towns and lineages, of conducting thriving businesses and trades, and all manner of endeavours that endure for generation after generation in parallel with our own. As a medical man I reeled at this unthinkable discovery, and my mind exploded with the implications but as an ordinary member of the human species, I felt the icy grip that claims one upon jumping into a cold pond on a hot day. Never again would I look upon the world, my world, the same. But here is where I differed from Bessinger and his ilk. I felt no disgust and loathing for these people, and that is what I knew them to be. People. Another sort of people, perhaps, but— people all the same. No, the disgust and loathing that consumed me on the drive home from that accursed lighthouse was for those who would round up these creatures for the purpose of medical experimentation, wanton torture, and in the end, wholesale extermination. When I left the Institute, I gave Bessinger my word I would consider the position carefully, and give him my final answer in the morning but I already had my answer before ever I left that malignant spire and the cathedral of misery that passed for a hospital. Indeed, it was with great enthusiasm that I would accept the assistant director's position at the New England Institute of Research for New Medicine. The night crawled slowly over Arkham like a comforting blanket, as it always does, but whatever peaceful dreams it might have brought to other homes than mine were not visited upon me. I was thoroughly befuddled by this discovery of impossible wonders I had arrogantly cast aside, under the guise of medical enlightenment. Knowledge of majestic marsh, and the other patients broke like the sea upon the crumbling walls of my psyche. For Bessinger's part— I was sadly all too aware of those who, under the cloak of research, tortured, killed, experimented upon, and then incinerated the bodies of countless of our fellow creatures, those small inhabitants of field and stream with whom we share our world. I knew also of the same unspeakable atrocities visited upon men and women in times of war, and worse, for sport and pleasure— among the most diseased minds who were my stock and trade. But this latest affront had left me utterly bereft of all sense as I tossed and turned in bed that night. How naive I had been to dismiss so many off-handed comments like, "'He's got the Innsmouth look,' or "'She has the marsh eyes,' or even "'He never used to look like that, so we always took him for one of our own,' and— now that he's an old codger, he looks just like them he does, and he's taken to swimming by moonlight, too. Don't suppose we'll see old Jeb around here much longer. At some point in the earliest hours of the morning, I shot upright in my bed, the fading tendrils of dream flowing quickly away like 
rivulets back to some dark, abysmal sea. All that remained was the shrieking scream of majestic marsh filling my head. I jumped to my feet and hastily dressed and went downstairs in search of coffee or whiskey. I cared not which, and in the end took a healthy draught of both. I could not wait a moment longer to begin my duties and execute my plans for that vile lighthouse hospital. But this was absurd. I had first to secure the position I hoped was mine for the taking. So I waited a decent hour and then dialed Bessinger's number, and as casually as I could manage, assured him that I was most definitely interested in the position, and could begin immediately if needed. The call lasted all of about five minutes. I was left then to settle my affairs at Miskatonic, securing a leave of absence from my position there, to pursue a vaguely outlined sabbatical which, even at such short notice, got little more than a curious glance and a cursory good luck. The same described my withdrawal from classes on campus, with the intention to return at the beginning of next semester. The remainder of the day was spent cloistered with my research colleagues. Dr. Gloria Gilman, no relation as far as we knew. Dr. Felix Marsh, a common enough name in these parts. Dr. Langston Waitley, and Dr. Casabel Carter. These last two were partners with a practice and small clinic on campus. Our final colleague was the darkly mercurial but remarkably proficient Dr. Meribeth Pickman. Our little Carter had been afforded great latitude and funding from the board of Miskatonic, due in large part to the revolutionary ideas of Carter and Pickman, that fell squarely outside the lanes of research by others on campus. We had been working on dreams as a form of treatment, most notably with some extremely promising results with shared dreaming between the group of us, led by the strongest dreamer of our little cabal, Meribeth Pickman. Our adviser and mentor, Professor Zebulon Marsh, rounded out our group. Although not participating in the actual dreaming, when we outlined to him my discoveries at the Institute and descriptions of patients housed there, he signed off immediately and without question on all we were planning to undertake, requesting to be kept apprised of every development and vowing to aid us personally, should any need arise. Our group had fallen together tightly during our first semester, and we quickly set out to explore the regions of sheer dreaming as each of us developed and perfected his or her own unique skills that enabled us to safely explore the nocturnal lands and aid our patients. We dream swimmers, as we called ourselves, took to the lands of dream like otters to a roaring brook. I was the opener of the way ensuring that we all entered the dream states quickly upon retiring for the night at home or in the lab when we chose more controlled experimentation. Felix and Langston ensured that we suffered no intruders of any sort during our proceedings, as this was always a very great danger. Gloria guided our movements with the skill of the master navigators of old, and Carter ushered us all safely back to port at the end of our journeys, ensuring we never tarried so long in the lands of dream that we might get lost, or become so enchanted with the many pleasures of deep dreaming that we refused, any of us, to return to the waking lands. This, of course, left the tasks incumbent upon Meribeth Pickman, without a doubt the strongest dream-swimmer of us all. Once we had entered those states, far beyond the plains of normal human dreaming, before any dream had materialized before us, we were each caught in the cataclysmic strata of cosmic winds that surround the world of the mind as a protective. These can blow whole worlds apart and turn minds and psyches into dust to be swept away into the lost folds of space forever. These borderlands are meant to be safeguards, keeping casual dreamers out of deeper and faster-running currents. But they can be quite dangerous, should one attempt unprepared to penetrate those barren, screaming wastes. It was Meribeth Pickman 
who stood strong as a beam, a lightning rod, the bellwether that drew each of us out of that maelstrom, and brought us all to stand safely on firm ground within the dream-state, to which we were to turn our attentions. Our achievements had been painfully slow and fraught with missteps, but we had finally begun to work together as a cohesive and highly effective unit, as a medical team in a surgery would set upon the injuries, diseases, and subtle maladies of the physical body, so we dream-swimmers would enter the minds of the most troubled and violent patients, and bring them peace in most cases, and even recovery in some of the most recalcitrant chronic cases. And as we were not brutally slicing into tender flesh, nor removing delicate portions of the brain critical to thought and normal human functions, we adhered first and foremost to our fundamental oath. We did no harm to any of our troubled patients. It was to these friends and colleagues that I relayed my discoveries at the Institute, and enlisted their enthusiastic support. I had then only to begin my new job— to set sail in the subterranean holds, and take stock of every soul in the place, employees, patients, and those poor creatures held captive in foul, grotto-like tanks far beneath the main hospital. I knew, of course, that it was Majestic Marsh who would be our true guide in this. That much the aged crone herself had made abundantly clear— when she nearly shattered my mind with her silent siren's call. But it was a secret, hidden, and wholly unfamiliar place within my mind that understood and answered that call in kind. The low, guttural warbling and meaningless chittering she had assailed my mind with in the beginning had emerged into words I fully understood. This, too, I conveyed to my fellow dream-swimmers— who glanced at one another furtively, while assuring me they understood and were with me to the end on whatever path these discoveries carried us. Meribeth said she had begun receiving nocturnal cries of distress from beyond Devil's Reef when she dreamed alone, and the others nodded they too had experienced the same. Gloria Gilman described whimpering voices in the night, pleading for help or death, deep within the eddies of her pre-dawn slumber. But when she tried to answer, she always awoke with a start, the sensation of icy fingers withdrawing quickly from her mind. Clearly, we had our work cut out for us, and equally clear it was that we were well cut out for the work. It was the job itself that I had to undertake alone. I surrendered myself to Dr. Bessinger— who oversaw the endless orientations, trainings, more signings of more and more documents, and several interviews with what some called G-men, those muscled but mild-mannered former military men, whose forced simple demeanour thinly conceals the callous brute, the cruel bigot, the sadistic child, and the clear candidate for the very treatments they oversaw. I shuddered to hazard a guess at what the dream-swimmers would discover in the depths of these so-called servants of the public good. These louts reiterated everything Bessinger hoped I would swallow whole, along with numerous litanies of poorly memorized jingoism and tired patriotic knee-slapping. Then it was all over, and I was cut loose to pursue my tasks, such as they were. To be clear, my position as assistant director was merely a titular formality, and really nothing more than a lackey with a large set of keys and no office. I was assigned to what they considered the worst job in the house, caring for the post-human, the barely human, and the had-never-been-human denizens of the deepest pits of the sub-basement, where they suffered, languished, and endured existence in foul-smelling vats filled with greenish waters, and hell alone knows what chemicals and compounds, and eventually died alone. These chambers of horror were also equipped with bizarre machines I could not fathom, 
and many bore obvious signs of being hastily constructed or jimmy-rigged for unknown purposes. I wondered if some of the creatures here were not already dead, and these tanks were merely preservative in nature. But no, every few minutes there would be some flurry of desperate activity in the tanks, most often in concert among the lot of them, as though performing a sort of murmuration. Some of the poor beggars broke the surface now and again, gasping for air, having yet to complete their transformation to a fully aquatic form. Groped and poured by hundreds of desperate imploring fingers and hands upon my mind, I staggered beneath the weight of these pathetic creatures' suffering. Because of this, I could only remain in these chambers for a short time. But I managed to keep them safe from further experimentation. All the while, a single name broke the surface of the cacophony. Majestic Marsh. But all I could do to calm them was to say, Yes, I know, and we are coming. My second week as the Institute's assistant director was uneventful. I spent my time familiarizing myself with the place's layout, who the various patients in this carnival of the grotesque were, and fulfilling my assigned duties. My discoveries were many. Each and every captive here was a resident of Innsmouth, or the watery environs around Devil's Reef. None of these curious individuals had been accused or charged with any crime, negligence, nor even the slightest affront against the peaceful workings of their usual society. And not a one of them ever ventured forth outside of Innsmouth city limits. Nor had any of them suffered any psychotic break or episode that might land them against their will in a psychiatric facility. This only underscored the putrescent rantings of Bessinger in his recruitment spiel and subsequent attempt at indoctrination. These people were here because they were different, and differences cannot be tolerated by stalwart patriots. And so, like the old saying, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. The people of Innsmouth had been rounded up like vermin, and were destined for wholesale extermination in the name of scientific inquiry or sadistic torture and mutilation, however one chose to direct his moral compass. I also realized that most of the employees here, besides the government men, were Gilmans, Marshes, Waitleys, Carters, and Pickmans. I even discovered a few far-flung relations of my own. This bit of news I shared with my colleagues, who found it highly suspicious, and demanding of greater scrutiny as speculation and theory ran wild among us. Then, fortunately, other than the occasional glance to check on my progress, I was left on my own for much of that second week. Friday afternoon, as I was preparing to leave, Bessinger called me into his office to tell me how pleased he was with my work, and how well I was adapting to their culture, whatever he may have meant by that. I mumbled some acknowledgment as I turned to go, but he called me back. You know, Gilman, I've heard a great deal about the work you and your colleagues have been doing. There's always a place here for exciting new ideas, for the right people with backbone and nerve, you know, the right sort. You and your friends should consider doing some consultation work here. There'd be a small stipend, of course, and you need only put in a few hours a week. How does that sound? Talk to your friends. There's a lot of room for expansion here. Exciting times, I'd say. He concluded with a grunt and a nod like a Caesar bestowing a gracious benediction upon the plebes of Rome. The man actually waved me away, all grins, thinking, no doubt, I was about to run home and tell the others about our good fortune. Only half of this was true, of course. I had no intention of casting any of this under the guise of good fortune. As I assumed they would be, the others were aghast, extremely suspicious of this offer, as so many of the names common among us were employees of the Institute. I knew where the answers we sought lay— 
and I was preparing myself through a variety of psychic exercises to knock upon that door. The third week of my employment was even more productive. There was nobody skulking about to see what I was up to. So I hastily, but thoroughly, and with compassion, saw to the needs of my patients in their beds and wheelchairs on the upper floors. Fragments of thought washed over me, and I kept hearing the term, deep ones. After a while, I realized this is what they called themselves when they chose to speak to me directly. They all resembled majestic marsh to some degree, great or small. I recognize now what I had heard referred to as the marsh eyes, those large, unblinking orbs that bore into you relentlessly. The broad, fleshy lips and the furtive references to transformations, those just begun, those in full bloom, and those who had forever cast off their human ways, to be clothed in the boundless waters of the sea. Those in the fullest bloom of this transformation, as well as those who had never walked the streets and dusky alleys of Innsmouth, having been born to the sea, floundered in their infernal tanks, swimming listlessly, beating the walls with fins, or flippers, or their bloodied fists and heads, pitiful in their nakedness, but fitting the shapes they assumed. Frogmen, mermaids, fish, all of these and none were equally true. Their distraught pleading as they came up to the glass walls of the tanks to implore me to free them, or barring that to end their tortuous existences. Be patient, was all I could manage, and they seemed to understand, but just floated away to languish at the bottoms of their tanks. The soulless, pitiful weeping about drove me mad, and it was all I could do to maintain my course. Throughout the next week, every time I crossed paths with Bessinger, he queried me about when Sam or all of my colleagues would visit the Institute and start putting in consult hours. At no point had I given him the slightest indication any of them were interested. He even began casually asking me about dream therapy, and if I ever contacted any of our patients here in dreams, or been contacted by them. I assured him that I had not, and never would, that such practices and research my colleagues and I were engaged in was absolutely separate from my employment at the Institute. Bessinger was visibly angered by this, and started to say something, but then held his tongue and dropped the matter with a shrug. Over the next few days, Bessinger brought up several times what a pity it was that my friends were too busy to even come to the Institute and see the work we were doing. I found this most irregular, but refused to take up the matter. Then, out of the blue, the man actually suggested that he come to Miskatonic to meet with us. I was dumbfounded and enraged, but I managed to hide it. Bessinger was up to something, and it was becoming abundantly clear that I had been hired for no other purpose than to gain access to the work the dream swimmers were doing, and that it was a key to some larger agenda. The proceedings of the Institute were monstrous enough, but why was he still so insistent in our joining the staff here, when I had rebuffed his advances firmly at every turn? Little did I know that the next three days would reveal all. For my part, my daily rounds were nothing less than a leisurely stroll through the various circles of hell. I had been promoted to oversee the most advanced and recalcitrant patients in their treatment. Attendants, who were nothing more than cruel thugs, would peel away the tender, hairless flesh of the patient's batrachian pates, revealing their very brains. This was accomplished quickly and without care or skill, and I blanched at the sight. I attempted to demonstrate more humane methods, but the louts actually rebuked my efforts. To the heads of these poor fellows they attached electrodes and affixed intravenous lines, and finally cut away various samples of the brain itself. And all this 
upon living beings. There was nothing I could do for them on my own, and sadly time and circumstances were not yet right to mount our ultimate campaign on their behalf. That night proved most instructive. The dream swimmers met at my home, because it was safer and more private than our laboratory at Miskatonic. We followed our usual complex ritual of procedures, and then we dreamed of the Institute. I opened and cleared the way. Meribeth gathered us from the shrieking and tumultuous astral winds. Then we roamed those darkened corridors, wards, and subterranean cells beneath the lighthouse. These last were worthy of any Inquisition galley, fitted out with the furnishings of torture. Langston and Felix held the waking world at bay, but I could feel the disgust and sadness from my friends as Gloria and I finally led them through these last cells. The final chamber served as the morgue, where several Batrachian bodies lay in ruined heaps under filthy blood and chemical-stained sheets. Some of them, their lifeless bodies still strapped into hideous contraptions, still bore the silent screams of unendurable agony on their dead faces. Finally, Meribeth Pickman called us to the wall on one side of that last cell. "'There's something here,' she said excitedly, her fingers working deftly over the surface of the wall. "'Follow me,' she said. And then, without another word, her subtle dream body passed through the wall and disappeared. We followed her, and made a startling discovery. Beyond the wall was a broad-stepped tunnel that plunged downward at a steep angle through the body of the earth. We followed Meribeth as she glided down the tunnel. After some minutes we heard the sound of waves crashing on the rock. A few more steps, and we came to the mouth of that tunnel, a broad, gaping moor that opened right into the crashing waves of the sea. I heard then the vibrating bell-like voice of majestic marsh in my mind, and in but a moment I knew all, not in words, but in pure understanding and memory. This lighthouse had been built by the people of Innsmouth to warn their brethren of the sea when it was not safe to come ashore. This tunnel was the means by which the sea folk came and went between the town and the waters of Devil's Reef. This realization was followed by the sounds of enraged battle as Meribeth engaged in a silent test of wills with an intruder. It was Bessinger his dream body looming over Meribeth, where she stood her ground and held him at bay. They stood locked in this rictus of violence for what seemed an age, as we watched and stood guard. Though he knew it not in his great hubris, Bessinger was ill-matched to deal with us, and not a fitting opponent for Meribeth alone. I knew then that she had given him leave to enter our midst for this very purpose, to force his hand and take his measure. We stood hard by as she bade us stand back. She wanted the good doctor for her own. We knew Meribeth well, and yet there were aspects of her nature we could not guess, ways of being she had been bequeathed through the tainted bloodline of her grandsire, Richard Upton Pickman, the great painter and rumoured ghoul whose disappearance was the stuff of legend. I looked away as I saw her rise up and fall upon Bessinger her dream body expanding to engulf him like a greedy, hungering maw. After several minutes of desperate struggling and flailing about, Bessinger's body was dropped to the ground, mangled, headless, and dead. Only the strange gurgling sounds filled the cavern, and then all was abruptly silent. Were those gasps and death rattles echoes of a dying man in a paroxysm of psychic and physical agony, or the joyous slurping and gnawing of a creature feasting and gorging after a long fast? I did not know, nor did I wish to. Each dream swimmer was a quandary, an enigma, a warren of secrets and shadows, of familiar legacies known only to him or herself. 
I knew this now, and despite our great bond, our deep camaraderie, and many adventures in the lands of dream, such horrible intimacies demanded that we, even we, protect and guard ourselves from ourselves and each other during those nocturnal forays. Each of us had abilities, affinities, and appetites that drew us to this work, hungers for knowledge and a raw, visceral experience that fed our souls. Yet in all this, one thing shone bright and sacrosanct among us, a code never to be broken. We did no harm. But here we were upon a dark business to free countless beings from perhaps the greatest harm we had ever encountered. So when Meribeth flew upon the form of Raymond Bessinger, as he attempted to move against us, she acted without hesitation, and with full intent to destroy him utterly. We had never seen her like this before. Tempest, harpy, banshee, a thing unleashed. And when Bessinger's shade and psyche were no more, and we heard those terrible bestial sounds arising from our dear young friend and colleague, we departed the chamber and left her to do all she must, all that was in her dark nature to do. One can never know what the aftermath of these dreamings would be. Would Bessinger recall what had befallen him? He must, for he had of his own will invaded our dreaming. Perhaps the man would have suffered a nightmare, and would keep to his bed all day. Perhaps the dreaming would invade the waking world in unimaginable ways, or remain forever an enigma, a mystery that may reveal itself, or remain locked away forever. When I arrived at the Institute the next morning, I was told that Raymond Bessinger was dead, brutally attacked, his body left in a pool of blood in his office. Nothing was known of the savage intruder, and none of the patients were missing from their locked cells. Will you think me a monster for secretly delighting in the thoroughness of Meribeth Pickman's work? I was named temporary head of the Institute. This afforded me the opportunity to peruse at leisure the files in Bessinger's office, and what I discovered there had implications for all of my colleagues and for myself. Indeed, it had not been my work that compelled Bessinger to hire me, or his relentless haggling with me to draw my friends into this business. In the end, it had been merely my name. I sat there that Friday afternoon when most of the staff had left, and what a staff it was! Besides the handful of government men, all other staff members were drawn from the families Marsh, Gilman, West, Wait, Waitley, Carter, and Ward. Viewing the files of these employees, I discovered that they were hired solely because they hailed from the oldest Innsmouth families. None of these employees of the Institute lived in Innsmouth, and were thought to be distant enough branches of these family trees, and to bear no mark of the look, and probably had no idea of any familial connections beyond names quite common in the area. It was with an icy chill down my back that I read in Bessinger's own hand how at the end of his programme of experimentation and eradication of the people of Innsmouth, and those peculiar swimmers taken from the waters around Devil's Reef, this programme of eradication would then extend to all staff culled from these families, including, of course, myself, as Bessinger could not take the chance that any of us might transform in later life to become fully-fledged Innsmouth kin, and revive the town and its activities. By Bessinger's calculations, there were no lines of Innsmouth families so far flung that they could be considered, in his words, clean of the Batrachian shadow that cast so long and deep that it must be forever wiped from the face of the earth. This, of course, explained the endless attempts to bring my miskatonic colleagues into this hideous business. The first step of our machinations was complete. Bessinger was dead, slowly coming to terms with my own, perhaps, deep affiliation with fine old Innsmouth stock. I made my way to Majestic Marsh's chamber, 
where I knew she would be well aware of everything, and waiting for me. I needed her thoughts on what I proposed to do, discard my cherished oath to do no harm in the name of what I saw to be a greater good for the greater number. I saw Majestic Marsh as the most august elder among the Innsmouth folk, as a matriarch, a sort of mother to us all. Something had clearly awakened in me as a result of the caress of that guttural and melodic voice upon my innermost being. So it was with deep reverence that I entered her chamber where she awaited me, with a slight smile upon her broad lips. "'My child,' she murmured silently, as I went to her and knelt beside her. That day, as the sun waned, and the employees of the Institute began to think of long rides home, dinner and kin and sleep, the silent voice of majestic Marsh wafted through the halls of the Institute, quickening a memory, an idea, a dream, or a secret in the hearts of all thirty employees, whose ancestors hailed from Innsmouth. As one they acted, not relenting until the great ravaging was upon them, and the bloody work was complete. The newspaper headlines relish this new development, as they do all disasters and catastrophes that hint of madness and scandal. Thirty dead in tragic fire at local psychiatric facility. Authorities question whether inmates gain their freedom, and in their panic set the place ablaze. The dead, of course, were the government men, and the brutish louts. Remaining staff must have left safely for the day before the trouble began. Such were the many headlines. Oddly, no trace or any remains of the patients were found in the smouldering ruins, though the shell of the lighthouse still stands. An open door leading into the sea at the bottom of a deep subterranean tunnel may yield answers. One room remained locked and undamaged by the flames, where a solitary old woman sat strapped in an ancient rattletrap wheelchair. I went immediately to her side, and moved to take her out of this place to safety, to my own home in Arkham, but she placed her cold, webbed hand firmly upon my own, and whispered, No. She had but a single wish. I wheeled the ancient matriarch out to the farthest point of the lighthouse grounds, where we looked out upon the crashing waves below, the angry white spume battering the rocks relentlessly in its fury. I was mesmerized by the changes that had become her. All at once, maiden, matriarch, vixen, siren, girl, and wizened crone, and so much more than these. She was now more beautiful and alien to my beleaguered eyes than I could ever describe in mere human speech. Utterly naked now, clothed in naught but the many-coloured shimmering splendour of her flesh, and the jewels that were the marsh legacy, atop her head the tall spiked crown of terrible majesty. Then, for the very last time, I heard the lilting music of majestic Marsh's sibilant song within the darkened hallways of my mind, and I obeyed her as I knew I must. Tipping the rickety old wheelchair, proud as any throne, I sent its royal occupant plunging into the foaming sea below. Postscript The government men lost interest in the area, and did not renew their nefarious activities in regards to Innsmouth's inhabitants. It seems there was so much more tantalizing news to occupy their attentions in headlines and murmurings from abroad. The lighthouse is now fully restored, a beacon for those of the sea, in the waters, and upon Devil's Reef who watch the skies for signs. Then, on those peaceful, quiet nights, under certain stars and the days of the most ancient festivals, that broad ray of light sweeps slowly over the sea, letting it be known that it is once again safe to come ashore and walk 
the darkened streets of Innsmouth. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.